Welcome to the Fantasy NASCAR Podcast brought to you by RaceForThePrize.com. We got Texas Xfinity salaries. Let's find the best point per dollar plays at the top. Find our value options at the bottom. Do our early week research. And you can do that by going to RaceForThePrize.com and grabbing the Fantasy NASCAR spreadsheet for 20 bucks discount and get in on it now. PayPal, Venmo, cash app the money over to me and I will share the sheet with you. Thank you for joining me on this channel and liking and subscribing. Let's recruit some more people. Let's get this thing going. We'll start at the top this week. Usually we go to the value at the bottom, but we'll look at the top. We've got three drivers that are priced up a little bit, but we do expect them to be a top ahead of the field. And we're in a race where there isn't an absolute ringer coming down. So that really does elevate Chandler Smith, Justin Allgaier, and Cole Custer's status. Obviously, Chandler Smith getting it done. We look at, in terms of hog points or dominator points, he's been our guy this year. Allgaier is there as well. Custer is always a part of that conversation. But it clearly seems to be Chandler Smith is our guy moving forward. And I have no problem rostering him, even at 11,200, 11,000. He would be my number one option real early. But again, Allgaier was really good at this racetrack. A lot's going to come down to uh, not necessarily practice, but being fast in practice so that you are fast and trimmed out and qualifying. And then you can remain trimmed out and stay up front throughout the entire race. This is not really a track where you're going to want to have a ton of downforce or you're really concerned about handling like you might be at a Phoenix or a Martinsville. You really just want pure speed at this pure speed track, especially if your goal is to win the race. Smith and Allgaier expect to have decent setups and to be fighting for that pole and then fighting for the win at the end. Allgaier's restarts weren't the best last season. and I wonder if he and his old age has taken a little bit of a step back on restarts, and that worries me, whether, whereas you're going to have Chandler Smith, who's going to be much more aggressive on restarts, and if also a goal is to lead laps in our DFS lineups, then I think that is a slight edge to Chandler Smith. It is a little bit precarious because of this racetrack. But again, Algar, who used to be a pretty strong restarter, I just am not completely seeing it moving forward. Not that it's a significant downgrade, but... When we look at it compared to Smith versus Allgaier, I believe Smith's more on the up and up. Now, speaking of leading laps, it would behoove us to look at all points from previous races. And you're going to see, for the most part, it's coming from the first couple rows. A track where, you know, we've got tons of restarts, we get tons of wrecks, and most of the safety is at the front of the pack. And you'll see we're going to target the guys that are going to qualify front. Now, your outliers are mainly going to be a, I think this is John Hunter Nemechek, a ringer, part-timer. And then this was Kyle Busch. So we take those guys out of the field this week. Then I would say that our laps led are going to mainly come from the front two rows. And that would be Chandler Smith. No problem. Slam them in. Now we'll go to the bottom and look at where we can save. Just talk about these guys maybe run through some builds. <clears throat> Leland Honeyman back in our life. If you can see the note on your screen, P31 after getting caught up in a stack up and having no sway bar for most of the race and a good amount of damage moving on from the weekend and forward to Texas. So that is a note to explain his poor finish at Martinsville. But before that poor finish at Martinsville, 20th, 20th, 11th at Phoenix, 18th at Las Vegas, 21st at Atlanta. Young Motorsports is doing a pretty good job of putting cars together for Honeyman, and Honeyman is being very safe in these races. Not the greatest, but from a kid jumping in this ride, new ride, new team, he's doing everything, checking all the boxes, and at 4,600, what are we doing? I mean, he's been optimal previous times this year. We go to, let's load that up. At Las Vegas, he was in the optimal lineup as your cheap punt at 4,900. At Phoenix, he was optimal at 4,900. And he didn't get in there in Richmond because you had other options and obviously the wreck in Martinsville. So clearly going to be a play. Easy way to save. As I've talked about, I think that the JD Motorsports truck cars are doing a little bit better. That's fine. You can consider Dawson Cram if we can maximize place differential. Rather lean into Honeyman, but... The question you're going to have to ask yourself is Honeyman's more likely to start inside the top 25. Cram is more likely to start outside of that. And would you rather chase place differential with limited upside? Because you're going to get a boost if there's wrecks and chaos. 
the cram is going to finish a little bit better than he normally will if he can just run the laps. But at the same time, you're going to get a little bit more of a boost there for Honeyman as well because it should be pretty equal from where they rank on the grid. It's a little bit tougher for some of these other drivers to get attrition points, but anyone can wreck, and most of the cars that wreck are going to generally be better than Honeyman and Cram. Cram may get a spot or two more through mechanical failures, etc. But that's just something you have to go over. I still think I like the potential upside of Honeyman better. Just a better driver, better equipment so far this season. Ryan Ellis, you get the feeling that at some point something good is going to happen for this team. And you may get lower ownership because when people are going to ultimately go through and look for their value options, they're going to look at finishing position and they're going to see that Ellis has been the weaker of the two TJM drivers and he's not really doing much better than Dodder. He's not doing much better than JD, but arguably the, the car has been better. The finishes aren't terrible. Last week he was on his way to a top 15 until he got wrecked at the very end of the race. You might have saw Tommy Joe Martin's tweet complaining about people being idiots. You may get lower ownership. He may get overlooked. 4,900 for a TJM car, it's pretty cheap. 4,900 for an experienced driver. Ellis has much more experience than Cram and Honeyman. It's pretty cheap. And if he goes out there and plays a little safer because they do have an, a torn up race car and a race where there are plenty of cautions, I really don't mind Ellis. I like Ellis more than I do Cram. The Ellis play has not been working this season. But again, there's a possibility that people look at the lens through Brennan Poole versus Ryan Ellis. And because Poole has been running so well and not making mistakes, and he is having a good season, and he's probably the better play, it will definitely depress Ellis' ownership. And he does maximize your savings. So he's definitely there. Can't take Emerling. If Blaine Perkins, this is not necessarily a track I want to roster him at, but it is a seed car. They are in the middle of the mid-pack. They do put together decent speed. If he doesn't make a mistake, that's a big if, a 5,100. Uh, not having starting position, I don't really care about it. But once he starts outside of the top 30, he then is right there with Ellis. He's right there with all of these guys. Now, if he qualifies closer to the front or closer inside the top 25, no interest. Same can be said for Balicki. It is a Gosling car. It can hang on to the lead lap. It can benefit at the end. Um, I like him more than I would a Smithley or a Star. You can't completely rule out Star because this is a Texas race. He always runs at Texas. He always runs well. He's probably sure to have pretty good equipment. He knows what he is doing. And he has shown that he can jump in at Texas and get solid finishes. And so he will be there as well. I don't love it. Smith would probably be my lowest on the group, but he's going to go out there and do the same thing as all these other guys. And if bad things happen to them, but I think he probably lacks the upside of some of the other drivers who have a little bit more going for them. But he is in there if you're building a bunch of lineups and you want some savings. Obviously, I like Honeyman the most. Else is probably right there. I think Poole definitely should be maybe your number two at 5,500. That's way too cheap for the way that he's performing. Look at his driver rating. Is it great? No, it's not supposed to be as a mid pack driver. That's still pretty strong for the mid pack. He's not the top of the mid pack, but that's lead lap type stuff. He's hanging in there at all these different diverse racetracks week to week. And more than, more than that, he's getting to the finishes. He's hanging in there, he's surviving, and he's taking the attrition boost at the end. 20 to 14 at Martinsville, 24 to 15 at Coda, 23 to 20 at Phoenix. Doesn't get the boost at Las Vegas, but he's right there. He'll be in contention at 5,500. He saves you enough. I like Honeyman. If I've got the money and Poole's starting position isn't too close to the front, which it probably will be, and at that case, I would downgrade him but not knowing, then Poole, based on what he has done, is right there. But when you start to look at starting position, you're more than likely to get these guys closer to the back, and that's going to put them as a little bit better DFS plays because Poole's just not going to have the upside, lacking the ability to get the place differential and benefit 
from all the chaos. Because, you know, some of these are the cars that they're going to wreck. And those aren't going to be spots that he's going to gain. But let's say, you know, these guys wreck. Star, Smithley, Balicki, those are spots for Cram. Haley Deegan's an interesting case. She has not worked out very well this season. It's been, I wouldn't go as far as to say it's an unmitigated disaster. She is a rookie. It is a new car. It was a good car. Not such a good car now with her in it. Um, you can make an excuse for we are running in a bunch of different tracks. And if there was a point in the season where she was going to struggle, it would be going from Phoenix, Dakota, to Richmond, to Martinsville. It's a high power, horsepower car with low down for us. She's mainly driven a truck. She has been to these tracks before, but it's just a completely different ride in the truck series. So if there was a place where she was not going to run well, that would be it. Where would she run well? Well, obviously the place that she did run well and was optimal earliest season at Las Vegas, finishing 18th. Now, for whatever reason, I think it will be easier for her to adjust to the intermediate track in this package. Texas is going to be tough. She has, though, raced at Texas in the past and has had decent finishes, gotten better each year. Obviously, her really good race, I think she had top 10 at Texas last season. That's inflated by the chaos that ensued. But let's also not overlook the fact that she avoided the chaos and got a solid finish. Don't want to put too much into that. But again, Deegan has not been working. But at 5,700 in a truck that we know can be fast with AM, or car, that can be fast with AM, the Swinsky self team, this could be an option. We'll see how comfortable she looks in practice. We'll see where she qualifies. But I mean, if we're looking at speed and the ability of the car at drivers below 600 or 6,000, I don't know if anyone else will have the equipment that she has. Seek so will be fine, but ultimately I think Deegan will have a better car if that matters. And it may not matter because of the wrecks and the wrecks could clearly be her. But uh, the point I wanna make is, yeah, we've probably been saying that no Deegan this week pretty quickly and that's been the right call recently but this is the week to say okay we need to put her back on the board and consider Haley Deegan as an option again we want to see place differential we got to see where these drivers qualify Sieg seems fine I think he should be a little bit cheaper I don't really see why going to Sieg over pool or rather I just chase a cheaper option and place differential because I don't see Kyle Sieg finishing that much better than Ryan Ellis or Lynn, Leland Honeyman if all things go as they could go what upside does he offer? Is he safer? Does he have better equipment? Possibly, but that may not be the route when we have 10 to 15 value drivers on the board and someone's going to hit. And so safety, security, in a Texas race with attrition and wrecks and chaos possibly, safety and security doesn't seem like it's necessarily a route I want to go in. If we got 10 to 15 value guys that can hit a home run, then I really need to nail the one or two guys to come through. I mean, just probability wise, if there's that many value options that can really be great point per dollar plays, at least two of them are going to come through. And when I look at Kyle Stig at 5,800, I find it hard to imagine, unless he starts really deep in the field, that he is going to be the best point per dollar play. I think you say the same thing for Jeremy Clements. Same situation of safety and security is nice. But will he be one of the 15 that maximizes point per dollar? And I just don't see that being the situation. Now we get to this group in the 6,000s where maybe we didn't really need to punt. Or maybe we did take one punt. And we also slide in a 6K guy so that we can still chase two hogs at the top. Because I think ultimately we will get two drivers running fast laps, laps led, and finishing in the top five. When we look on average, we get one driver in the 40s, 22, 15, 10. So I can't imagine that we're going to build a lineup that only has one driver leading laps. Even if there's one guy that leads a bunch of laps, you still have the option of a guy, second guy, putting in a very big score, which is probably double. I mean, you get 24 hog points from a driver, and that's more than likely going to be an expensive driver. Look at that as place differential. If we think of 
all right, what's the place differential we can get from a top tier driver? You're not getting 24 place differential points from a top tier driver. You may be getting 10 place differential points from a top tier driver. So that's double what you could get. And on top of that, if your top tier driver is scoring 24 hog slash dominator points, they're also more than likely maximizing finishing position. So you get that boost as well. That being said, you want two drivers from the very top. They're going to be expensive. And so we are going to look into the punt range. We are going to look into the value range. And these blue drivers all have plenty of upside, much safe, secure, and for my money are underpriced. Kyle Weatherman's having a pretty solid season. 6,100 at the bottom of the list, and he's probably at the bottom of the list for me. Results aren't really that much better than Brendan Poole. I probably would rather go to Brendan Poole, but Weatherman's fine. We got to see where he starts. Again, like Poole, if he starts, got the old ad block coming on. Close to the front, then that's going to downgrade his status. Anything I'm afraid of, 6,300 for hour. Slight improvement in terms of running, which is expected. It's better equipment. And maybe a better driver, hard to say. But you're going to get a little bit more upside. Again, qualifying position is going to determine his value. And again, it's going to come down to point per dollar plays, who can maximize the points, because there is so much value. As you can see, the punts are all pretty viable at Texas, and they're all really affordable. And they've been slightly competitive this season. These value drivers, the same can be said. And I think there's a strong argument they're underpriced. Jeb Burton has not shown a lot of upside, but for the most part, for an Anderson car to routinely get top 20s, not wreck out, 17, 19, 22, 16 in terms of driver rating, he is not getting the finishes that he deserves. At some point, we're going to get a regression. Maybe you can get lower ownership because people will be harping over his finishing position and not really looking at, well, he's running a lot better than where he's finishing. Things could turn around at any time. He is in within striking distance in most of these races. It's just not going his way. So we go into a Texas race where we expect some chaos and some wild things to happen. As long as he avoids that, he is a top 15 driver at 6,500. Alfredo is a top 15 driver at 6,300. And you can see kind of this is racing in general, right? If you look at their numbers in terms of driver rating, the Anderson car versus the hour car, which are at the top of the mid pack, very similar. The difference is things are not going Burton's way. Things are working out for Alfredo. Now you could say that's luck. You could also say it's skill. It's going to come down to what you think. And the trick is though, like if it is really skill and most people are going to probably lean towards Alfredo because they're going to look at finishing position, then that's not good. But if it is luck and just needs a break, then you're going to get lower ownership on Jeff Burton in the situation. Now again, it is all determinant of starting position. Daniel Dye is going to jump in for Colleg. Did that last season. Finished 17th despite being in one of the spin-out wrecks. 6,600 Colleg car, 6,800 Colleg car for Josh Williams. Both are fine. I would rank them right next to Burton and Alfredo. Really what we are going to see to differentiate and even see it in Benedetto in there as well. Which Benedetto is not going to maximize your savings. But as long as he doesn't start too close to the front, it's a common theme here, he'll be in this category of the values that we'll go after. Most of these guys probably can't top 10 unless there's carnage. But I would argue that from Alfredo up, maybe even Weatherman, they can get to 15th. Starting position is going to be the big factor in ownership and in maximizing points. May not necessarily worry about ownership in this category. What I would really want from these guys, because they do have more upside than our punts, is who's ultimately going to have the best day. Who's going to run the best? They're all going to run and fight in the mid-pack. Who's really going to push it and go for it? The Benedetta probably is going to push it and go for it. You do run a little bit more wreck risk. Williams is slowly getting better. Daniel Dye probably going to be aggressive. Run double duty this week. Although I don't know if truck race is going to help him that much. Jumping into an Xfinity ride. <clears throat> kind of see a no man's land here with Ryan C, Retzlav, and SVG, all top 15 drivers. Probably should start in those positions. I don't see them being good point per dollar plays. 
Jesse Love, Kligerman, and Heim all present an interesting opportunity. They're not that expensive, and they're probably going to slide in there in the lineup. Once we put in our value, once we put in our top-tier drivers, they might work. They're also going to start close to the front, but because their price is a little bit lower and they have a little bit more upside, they could work. Heim, the Hunt Toyota, has been borderline top 10 car. Borchetta, Patrick Donahue talked about him in the previous podcast. I like what they're doing. Kligerman is legit a top 10 driver every week. He almost won this race last year. Gives you an idea of the chaos, but also the possibility under this. I mean, the Borchetta Big Machine car won the Texas race with Tyler Reddick several seasons ago. I believe um, who was randomly in this car in one year, and he had a pretty good race. We can look that up later. My concern with Jesse Love, though, is that although he has tons of intermediate track experience in the ARCA series, and the ARCA cars have enough power under the hood, but the ARCA cars have tons of downforce. He's going to go to Texas. He's got the power, but a lot less downforce. I could easily see him struggling at this racetrack. So that would probably lean me more towards Park Kligerman with the savings, the experience, and I really like what Big Machine has done at this track. I really like what they're doing in general. Heim getting plenty of experience, double duties, don't mind it. I think I go Kligerman. And then the other two, it's, and we've already been through this situation before, the place differential is going to determine the difference between Love and Heim. And again, we don't need Kligerman starting too close to the front. Brandon Jones, in a chaos race, can have a great race. In a chaos race, he's usually the chaos. Taylor Gray is kind of a little up there in price. I don't think I can get there. All of these drivers are people that I will look at from Taylor Gray to A.J. Smith, Herbst, Mayer, Creed, Truex Hill. All capable of top fives. It's going to come down to chasing place differential for me when I look at that category. And then again, that opens us up at the top. Let's run through some possible builds and see what these things are going to look like. We'll start with our favorite two hogs and Chandler Smith and Justin Allgaier. One leaves us with $69.50 per driver. Let's go to the bottom. Let's take our super punt in the sugar daddy, Leland Honeyman. Sugar man. You guys ever listen to Rodriguez? Just check that out. I've mentioned it before on the podcast. Very cool documentary. Very good album. Rodriguez, Sugar Man. Sugar Man. Cool story. Guy from Detroit becomes a superstar in Africa, unbeknownst to him. It's wild. Pretty wild. Check it out. 77 left. Let's take another guy in the mid value area and we'll go with Alf. Don't call me Alf. It's fast pasta. I'm not ready to buy into fast pasta yet. Because A, Alfredo is not pasta. But I will stop calling you slow cheese. He is no longer slow cheesy. It is official. Tony Cheese. I do like Tony Cheese. Tony Cheese. Alf. Good nicknames. Probably should stick with those. We're not going to buy into fast pasta. But if he gets in the optimal lineup and we got him this week, then yeah, we'll buy into fast pasta. Whatever. Win us money, you can be fast pasta. Lose us money, you're turning to cheese. Kirk, 84.50 left. That puts us in that range that I was talking about before where I could go with Love and Kligerman. You can get them both. Or Heim, that's fine. But maybe I want to chase a place differential at the top. Maybe we believe in the all-star ride of JGR. We go with Ryan Truex. That gives us 6,600. Not a terrible spot to be in. We like some of these $6,600 drivers. You can go to Jeb Burton. Go Kyle Weatherman. And then we're back down here to the Haley Deegan range. Could be worse. Let's go away from Fast Post and try to save a little bit more money. We want to go Extreme Savings just to see how much we can maximize. We will. We'll go with Ryan Ellis, who I spent a little bit of time talking about. 4900 We are double punting. I don't know if this is the route, but here you go. 8000 and that gets us up to Corey Heim. We can also play around with Ryan Sieg. Not really crazy about these drivers in the 7Ks, but I don't think anyone will be. So you could get lower ownership. 
Obviously, they will pop if we can get a poor starting position from them. You want to leave money on the table with the Benedetto, maybe. Maybe you want to get away from Ryan Ellis and say, you know what, I'll take the Alpha Prime card that's actually finishing every week and doing much better. So you spend up a little more on pool. And I think it's going to keep leaving us in the seven range where we're not really crazy. We're going to need something starting position-wise to really pop off. And, you know, SVG has been good. But is he going to score much points? I don't know. We can't get the Parker than that's build. Benedetto does have that upside. I don't mind going there. Josh Williams does have the potential of a top 15. It's going to matter on his starting position. Daniel Dye is probably a little bit more risky. Uh, let's say we don't want Truex. We want to save a little bit more. Sammy Smith is really starting to adjust to the car or the new team. No reason why he shouldn't have speed. Maybe it's a top five, six or seven place differential points. And then let's go extreme savings. See where this leaves us. Then we'll take Ryan Ellis. Dawson Cram will give us two more points, but I feel better with Ryan Ellis at the moment. That gets us up to 9K. You get Taylor Gray. Not bad. And you can get in the danger zone with Brandon Jones. Um, if I were to slot in Dawson Cram, I could get up to AJ Allmendinger in this build, which again is not that bad. But I don't know how much AJ Allmendinger upside we really are offering. And to be honest, I don't know who I'm really missing out on. All right, let's try it. I know what you're thinking. Can we build a lineup with Smith, Allgaier, and Cusp? But typically, this isn't the best way to go because there's just not enough fast laps and laps led to circle around. Yeah, you can. We can even get away from that and take some decent guys that could survive the attrition. We'll just go put Poole and Deegan in to give you an idea. Well, actually, I don't want to put two people on the screen. I don't want to build a full lineup. I know it's not really illegal anymore, but I'm old school DFS. And you may once know that I put a full lineup on the screen. That lineup hit. Didn't think anything of it. I log on to Twitter. This was back in 2017. I log on to Twitter and I've got like 50 notifications. And someone said, here's put this thing on the screen. Some very important person. And boy. Trouble ensued. Got some phone calls from some important people. And so from that point on, although the industry has changed a lot since then, and people put full items on the screen, I'm not doing it. I'm not making that risk anymore. 6,900 available. That opens up anybody in the 6Ks from the Benedetto down. That is fine by me. I know the initial reaction is I don't like the idea of having three drivers under $7,000. But let's explore that right now before we wrap up this podcast. Do you agree that some of these drivers are underpriced? Okay, so then you kind of have to reset your mind of, I don't like the build with under 7K guys. Well, they got the pricing wrong. So yes, initially in our general theme is like, you don't really want three drivers under 7K. But it seems like DraftKings was too soft for the Saudis. And if that's the case, we can't necessarily approach it the way we always do. Second part of that, Texas has Rex. Texas has Lucky Dogs. They have wave arounds. It has chaos. It also boosts the value of those drivers. I think those drivers are underpriced for a regular track, and they are egregiously priced based on the nature of Texas. So with those two thoughts in mind, we shouldn't be as hesitant to roster drivers under 7K. At the same time, do we really believe that this is going to be often? That's early in the week. I, you know, uh, it's not going to be all right, Chandler. You get the lead now. Just Nagar, you get the lead. Then Oprah comes out and says, "Look under your chair, Cole Custer. You get the lead as well." However, if we can get place differential from an Allgaier who sometimes does not qualify where he's supposed to, picks up some fast laps, some place differential, I don't have a problem with it. Because I think ultimately these guys could have really good point per dollar plays. Again, going back, revisiting. If we've got 15 value plays that are all very possible and a race that can be chaotic, they can be very efficient. And Algar may not be the best point per dollar play, but as more value opens up, it allows these drivers who might be slightly overpriced to be fine. 
And then you have to ask yourself, how do these guys score? Unless they surprise us, and you can see in practice maybe, and we can see in qualifying. But really, do we expect these drivers to be in contention? Austin is having a good year, but he's not being a hog. Sheldon Creed is his own mystery, and I don't even want to talk about that. Mayor Terps has been, I would argue, slightly disappointing. Now, when we see practice and qualifying, that's what's going to open up the conversation about these other drivers and how the build's going to go. But if these guys look like they are elite, then this build is not the craziest thing in the world. That's about all we need to go for this price check. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for joining us. This thing's growing. We're building something. Please like. Hit that like button right now. Subscribe if you haven't already. And share, tweet, Facebook, Instagram, whatever. Get these things out there. Recruit more people to this team, to this movement, to this crew. Raceforthepries.com, PayPal, Venmo, Cash App. 20 bucks. You can swing it. Got to pay for the 3Ds, diapers, daycare, and Mickey D's. I know we're not doing diapers anymore, but it still sounds pretty cool. You know why we created this thing. You know why you've been here. You've been supporting my family. And I try to support, help you. Save you time. Make it easy. Make it fun. Entertain you as much as I can. Be as efficient with your time. And help you out. Get you into this thing. Enjoy this thing. Positive vibes here. No negativity. No angry moments. Trying to keep it cool. All right. I am truly blessed to have you guys here. And I really mean that from the bottom of my heart. It is really cool to see all the growth and the comments. Keep them coming. And I respond to all of them. Emails, DMs, I respond to all of them. I appreciate you so much. All of you. Love you guys. Trip to life, fantastic.